Bongani Kema for us uh, there in KZN. Uh, well, uh, let's discuss this uh, further and uh, the role of climate change in all of this. We are now joined via Zoom by Professor Francois Engelbrecht, uh, Professor of Climatology and Director of Global Change Institute at the University of the Witwatersrand. Uh, very good afternoon to you, Prof. Thank you for giving us your time. Thank you for having me, Flo. Much appreciated. You're most welcome. I mean, let's talk about this. I mean, is climate change to blame for uh, some of these, what we're seeing really as laymen, as extreme weather uh, uh, phenomena, uh, particularly what we're seeing here in the country? I mean, you'll be seeing what's going on in, in KZN. We saw those April floods and here we, we are uh, again. Or is it, you know, more the frequency of it? I mean, yes, we've seen floods before, but the frequency is starting to be a little bit um, concerning. What can you tell us? Yes, most certainly climate change is across the world causing increases in the number of these heavy rainfall events. We are witnessing that, in fact, in almost every inhabited part of the world. It's not too difficult to understand why. Um, because of global warming, regional atmospheres are also getting warmer. And that means that at a city like uh, Itaquini, with the Indian Ocean just to the east and the Gunas current just to the east, there's so much more evaporation and so much more water vapor that finds its way into this warmer atmosphere. And it means that when an intense storm system forms, like we've seen back in April and we've seen just now, a yeah. very, very similar weather system forming over the eastern part of South Africa, there's more moisture available to produce rainfall. And if we look carefully at the statistics of the last five decades in South Africa, we can indeed see a systematic increase in the number of heavy rainfall events everywhere along our east coast and also into the eastern interior. And this trend um, persists all the way into Mozambique. So South Africa will have to increasingly deal with the more frequent occurrence of these intense rainfall events. Some preliminary research has now also been published, not yet fully peer reviewed, but the in initial indications that we have yeah. is that climate change also made the April floods more intense mm -hmm. by about 10%. So it's not that climate change per se is causing these events. We should, we should remember, of course, KwaZulu-Natal is our wettest province. It has a high rainfall. The average annual rainfall is more than a thousand millimeters. But climate change is making these intense storm systems to produce even more rainfall than in the past. Yeah. Uh, is there a way to, you know, stop uh, climate change or, or rather, you know, is there a way that we can reverse um, some of the effects of, of climate change or have, are we too far gone at this stage? No, absolutely. We can still do so much to slow down climate change. Right now, we don't have any technologies that can reverse the climate change that have already occurred globally and in South Africa. Mm. But we most certainly can prevent further climate change from happening, or at least some of it. Now, global warming has now reached a value of about 1.2 degrees Celsius. It's probably too late for us to prevent 1.5 degrees of global warming from occurring. That is waiting for us probably in the early 2030s. Yeah. So we need to brace for further impact. We need to adapt to these changes. There are so many things that we can do. But worldwide, if all the nations of the world collaborate like never before, and we reduce swiftly our dependence on fossil fuels, we still have an excellent chance of restricting global warming to below two degrees Celsius. Yeah. And that means we can prevent many future impacts of climate change happening in our own country. Yeah. And, and I mean, that also brings me to, um, you know, the, the, the government's way of responding to such uh, disasters. I mean, looking at uh, what happened uh, in, in, in KZN in April last year and considering uh, the fact that South Africa has experienced over 40 flooding disasters in the last uh, 40 years. What would you say about uh, uh, government's respond and, uh, response and how they should actually be responding? I mean, you're talking about the fact that we should be adapting to changes. Um, it seems as though some of the measures that are put in place are really temporary measures measures you know it's almost like putting a band-aid um over a gushing wound at this at this point so w what are some of the suggestions that you would you know be putting forward it's a deep question and we can talk i think we can spend an entire program on this <laughs> um government's role is going to become increasingly important yeah 
The first step is accurate early warning systems. So the South African Weather Service needs to be equipped and needs to have the technologies, for example, in terms of radar systems, weather prediction models, so that they can predict these events as accurately and as skillfully as is possible. That's step one. But that's only where it starts. It starts with the science where we need an even more urgent effort from government, and that's national, provincial and local government, is how we make use of these early warning systems in South Africa. What we need are so-called community-based um, flood early warning systems. Mm. So we need to communicate and equip our communities so that they have the ability and understanding to respond to these warnings. To these warnings. So South Africa will have to learn how to evacuate thousands of people out of the path of an emerging destructive flood event. If we had such systems in place back in April, we could have saved hundreds of lives. Mm. Now there were some wards at least in Etiquini where such, a, such systems were in place and where many lives were saved. But this needs to be scaled up right across South Africa because we have tens of thousands of households that are living below the floodlights. So it's an immense role that's waiting for government from the local level all the way to the national level. Um, so we have to be extremely proactive and I think we have uh, really strong challenges facing us. We've just heard from the, the insight you've played mm. that the member from the community mentioned that this is not the first time that this has happened in his community. Yeah. So the other really big issue is, should we accept that our communities should live in these vulnerable locations forever? Um, no, of course. But we know also that it's a big challenge in South Africa to convince people to give up where they are living and to move to safer land. We know that costs a lot of money. But a long-term adaptation plan that we, the government does have through the national adaptation strategy on, in terms of climate change needs to be implemented and executed. And in the long run, we need to move our communities to safer lands yeah. where they still have access to water and transport to the city so that they can compete for jobs and so forth. So it's, it's a very big challenge. I realize that yeah. while we are working on that long-term adaptation, we must have the early warning systems and the evacuation plans in place so that we yeah. can protect our communities while they live in these vulnerable locations. Prof, we really do appreciate your input. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, professor Francois Engelbrecht uh, there, who's a professor of climatology and uh, director at uh, Global Change Institute at the University of uh, Vatvatistan.